Today I'm welcome to Squiz.com, the platform that allows you to connect, collaborate, and trade. Today I'll be showing you the changes we've made to the Squiz.com connector software in the 1.25 release, which includes 8 new features, 7 improvements, and 6 bug fixes. The Squiz.com connector is a free piece of software developed by us that allows a business to connect any of its business systems, software, databases, spreadsheets, and files, storing data into the Squiz.com and Todex platforms. Allowing businesses to save and make more money by automating data management and transfer it between its systems, and other supplier and customer systems. Now you understand what the connector can do, let's look at the changes we've made to the 1.25 release. This release adds the new ability to export a list of sales orders out of connected systems, web services, databases, or files using the generic adapter, and have those sales orders be imported back into an organization's business system via the squiz.com platform. This is perfect for automating sales order workflows when orders are raised in online marketplaces, online websites, quoting software, customer relationship management systems, also known as CRM systems, and any other business systems, where orders from those systems need to be automatically retrieved and imported into the back-end freight, ERP, and accounting systems. As a part of this, the release includes a generic adapter preset to Channel Advisor. Channel Advisor can be used for a business to efficiently sell across a myriad of different online marketplaces, including eBay, Amazon, Catch, Kogan, Ozdeal, MyDeal, and many other consumer-based marketplaces Channel Advisor supports. Using the connector's Channel Advisor preset, orders raised across all these marketplaces can be retrieved via the Channel Advisor system and be automatically imported to the back-end systems via Squiz.com. Squiz.com can validate the orders, add in any missing order data, such as allocating multiple warehouses to orders, and it can also send the orders onto both the back-end systems and across to the freight carriers via its integration with Smart Freight. This can provide a highly integrated, automated and streamlined solutions for businesses selling into the expanding consumer space. Within the 1.25 release, the Connectors Datasets feature gets a number of enhancements. This includes the new ability to set attribute data against locations. This allows an unlimited amount of data to be set up against each location, such as brand data or highly detailed location-based information. Also within datasets, you can now define a list of category trees that each category can belong to. These category trees can be used to aid customers on how to find products by setting up category trees for multiple catalogs, product brand-based searching, and any other ways that users find products based on navigating collections of categories. Within the datasets feature, there is also now the ability to generate a missing product data report. The report generates a spreadsheet CSV file that can highlight products that are missing data across any relevant product fields, and it can also be highly customized to look at interlinked data, such as products that are not assigned to certain categories, certain flags, among many other options. The missing product data report can be set up to run as a routine that can run on a periodic basis that sends emails out containing both a summary of the missing product data as well as the attached report. This can make it easier for data maintainers to find and add missing product data across the data sets managed in the connector, ensuring that the required product data is there so that way those products can be sold across the squiz.com and Todex platforms. Within the datasets, this release also added an ordering column to the combination profile field values table. This allows the field values to be custom sorted, which can be important when customers need to view and select from a list of field values to determine which product they wish to purchase when the product combination feature is used. The Connectors 1.25 release adds a new generic adapter routine that allows batch script files to be run, either once off or at a scheduled time. This can be very handy when certain things need to happen in the operating system at specific times, such as clearing out files, cleaning up directories, or calling other software to perform certain actions at certain times. Batch script files can be used to automate a number of steps that administrator users would otherwise have to do manually themselves. And this provides a higher level of automation, reduces errors, saving time and money for a business. Now, if that's not enough, this release includes a number of smaller improvements and bug fixes that can be read in the connector's version history. This can be done by going to the connector's documentation center and scrolling down and clicking on the version history link. And from there, we can view all the details of the 1.25 release. And as always, feel free to subscribe to the Squeeze.com YouTube channel to stay informed when we release new great functionality in the future. For now, let's look at the latest changes we've made to the connector. Within the connector's 1.25 release, we've added the new ability for the generic adapter to retrieve and export out sales orders from connected business systems, 
databases, web servers, and data files that allows those orders then to be sent across into a connected business system via the squiz.com platform, as well as being sent across into freight carriers via the smart freight software. So here I have a diagram that shows how this works. Within the connector software, we can configure up a generic adapter to be able to export sales orders out of the many of the different pieces of software that a business may be using. So this could be quoting tools, such as tools used to raise sales orders and quote out orders. It could be online marketplaces, such as Amazon and eBay, marketplaces that allow us to get access to sales orders. They could be from websites where a business is selling, such as an e-commerce based website. They could also be from customer relationship management systems that can then raise sales orders with associated customers, or they could be for our own business systems that may be storing sales order data. So within the Connectors generic adapter, we now have the ability to export the sales orders from all these different systems. And then what the connector can do with those sales orders is push them across into the squiz.com platform where the squiz.com platform can then validate these orders to ensure that they can train the correct information. Squiz.com also adds additional information that may be missing in the sales order, which is required for it to import into other systems. And it can also optionally reprice the sales order, such as if we're getting it from a quoting tool that may have old pricing, we may need to have that sales order repriced based on the latest pricing that has been set up. Squiz.com also can sign warehouse locations to it on a per product or on a order level, so that ensures that the order goes to the correct warehouse house for picking, packing and shipping. Squiz.com also supports having that order then being sent across into both an organization's own business system, such as where it would go into here. As well, Squiz.com has the ability to send the sales order across to the freight carriers via a smart freight integration to ensure that the relevant consignment note is then raised automatically in the warehousing to make it easy for the warehousing guys to pick, pack and deliver that order as well. So using the connector software, by retrieving the orders out of all these different systems, the connector can provide a great deal of automation. So allow these orders to automatically flow through to the relevant business systems to make sure that they are processed efficiently and the keying and data entry from all these different tools uh, no longer needs to occur, which saves ultimately saves lots of time and money for everyone. Now to see how we can set this up within the connector software, if we go into the connector software for a generic adapter, if we click on the settings button, Within the data exports tab, if we look in the export types, we can see that there are now nine data exports that are available for us to be able to export out the sales order data. For all these exports to start off the, with the word sales order, they allow us to achieve the different pieces of data of a single sales order. And this last export we have here called sales orders allows us to retrieve a list of sales orders or the summary of a list of sales orders. So the first export that gets called when we want to export orders is this thing called sales orders. So this export, its job is to find a list of sales orders that need to be exported from a given system or a given data source, whether it be a database, uh, a folder containing sales order files or a web service. Once this export has the list of orders, then it will then call the sales order export for each of those sales order records. And that is used to retrieve the overall details of a single sales order. After that, then it continues on to get uh, the sales order lines will get the details of each line assigned to a single sales order. It will then get the taxes assigned to each line. It will get the attributes uh, that are assigned to each line. And then it'll go on to retrieve the surcharges, uh, such as freight surcharges or credit card fees, uh, gift wrapping fees, uh, minimum order surcharges, and get the taxes associated to that. So that's the order in which the overall sales order exports for the generic adapter works. So there's a couple examples I'm going to show on how we can export uh, sales orders out, but there is many opportunities on how this can play out. One simple example is if we had a directory which was store had a list of sales orders that are stored, and that could be because we have a tool such as a quoting tool that can generate out the sales order data. Now that could be as CSV files, it could be as, in this case, JSON documents or JSON files, or it could be XML files. But alternatively, we, we could easily configure the generic adapter to pull out the sales orders from an ODBC or SQL Lite or Microsoft SQL Server compatible database. And we'd be using the different data source types that we've got available in the generic adapter to do that. So for the example I'm going to be showing today, we're just going to be looking at the sales order files. And the second example, we'll be looking at the channel advisor preset. And that will show an example of how we can export orders from a web service in the next topic. So we'll start off with a simple scenario. So the sales orders exports, we need to retrieve a list of sales order files. Now I've configured this 
a data source called JSON data files. And within that data source, it's going to look in the directory that I have got set up here. And it is going to look for files that contain JSON data or JavaScript object notation. And so that's going to get all files that have start with the prefix sales order dash any characters before the file extension. So it's going to be able to pick up on sales order one and sales order two here. Then after that, it's going to go into the content of each file. So here's an example of what that content looks like for that file. So that's a JSON format document. And it is going to get the list of all the orders that may exist within when, within one file. So this file can only adds one sales order record, but it could easily contain multiple records. So getting all objects that are under the data records path within the file. So that's here. And that is going to retrieve this basically this single order that is in this file. And then within our data fields for the sales orders export, we don't have a list of all the sales order fields. We've only got the fields which are important. Um, so that is the unique identifier of, of the sales order and sales order code, the unique identifier of the customer account and the, as well as the customer account code and the creation date. So once we get these overall details of all the list of sales orders, this export, then we look at the sales order data export. And this is where we're going to retrieve the details for a single sales order. So for the sales orders export, all the data that comes available here is now then available as data hooks within all these other data exports. So we can see we're using the key sales order ID, that's a unique identifier of the sales order into the file path or the URL path to retrieve a single sales order. So for the first record that this export picks up, this would be the first file called sales order one. And then within that file, it is going to pull out the key sales order ID of the value of one. And then we can use that value within the sales order export. And that is then going to set up the path to just re retrieve the order data again out of this single file. And then this time we're going to get all the sales order information out of that file. So that way we can export it out to squiz.com where it can be processed. So that, that is how that is working. Now there is a special case here for all the other dependent data exports here. So let's just take a look at the sales order lines. If the data export URL setting is left blank, then the order data that is retrieved from the sales order export will then also be passed across to the sales order lines export. So that means we don't have to keep retrieving the same order data again and again. We only retrieve it once through the sales order export, then we can pass it to all the dependent exports that can reuse that same data. But there could be cases where we do want to specifically retrieve, make a different request to get these sales order lines. And if we wanted to do that, then we just need to set the URL or the file path where those lines for that particular sales order are located. So once we've done that, we can set it once again to how we're going to find those lines. So in our example here, it's going to go down through the sales order record and look for the lines to get the contained details of each product which is being sold within the sales order. So this export will then iterate through each of those lines and then we have to then get the relevant data out for each of those lines. And in order for quiz.com to correctly be able to import the order, there are certain data that is mandatory to be able to export the orders out. Now we can find that out by if we go to the squiz.com's platform API page, there is a section there called import organization sales order. And if we scroll down past that, there is a link to its dedicated page that tells us all the information that is required. And the thing we particularly care about is the sales order record fields. These tell us the fields which ma must be mandatory for us to export out the sales orders. So if we're looking at lines, for example, the fields that we must set in the export data is the line type. And then we either need to have the key product ID or the product code fields set. And we also need the quantity field that determines how much of a given product is needs to be ordered. And conditionally, we need to in include the pricing fields if we want the order to not be repriced by Squiz. But if we, if we do want to allow the order to be repriced by Squiz, then we don't have to include the, the pricing fields. So from here, from the documentation, this tells you all the fields that you need to be able to specify in order to allow the orders to be imported into Squiz. So back within our connector, we don't necessarily need to need to provide the product description or name since Squiz will be able to determine that for us if it's required. But we do need to set the quantity field that is a so that way it knows how to price it. And we also need to set either the product code or the key product ID as well. Now, the more information we give to Squiz, then the less information that Squiz needs to then add to the orders. 
so that uh, could be relevant. Otherwise, Squeeze will try to set the default values for different fields, such as if the product name is not given, then Squeeze will try to set the product name with the data that it has available. And that will continue on for each of these data exports. So once these have been set up, we've set up our paths to get out the data from, the, in this case, our files that are storing the order information. Once we've set that up, uh, we need to also make sure in our adapter, we have correctly configured the squiz.com system settings. So that allows us to submit orders across to squiz.com for an organization. So there's a prerequisite that we've already created an organization on squiz.com. Uh, so we need to put in its ID, the API key for that organization, as well as its password. And here we have the setting to decide if we want squiz.com to reprice sales orders when it's been exported out to squiz.com. That's it to no, then Squeeze will keep the pricing in those orders. If it's set to yes, then it will reprice those orders based on the pricing data it has available against that organization. So before we can run these sales order exports, we make sure that we've registered the organization in squeeze.com. We've all imported our products, um, the customer accounts, the sales units, the uh, payment types, and the tax codes to allow Squeeze to properly validate those orders. Once that it is all done, we, th we can then go into the export routines button. Now within the data exports list, there is an export called export sales orders. And then once we've selected that, we'll click on the squiz.com platform and click the run once off button. And we can optionally have this run on a scheduled basis. So if we want to export out orders or check for orders that need to be exported, then we could set up a routine for this to run, uh, say once a day or once an hour to keep checking for new orders and then allows it to automatically push the orders across into squiz.com and onto the corresponding business system. So once we've set that up, either as a scheduled routine or we run this once off, we click that button. If all is successful, then we, within the history log, we will see the orders that has been successfully submitted. So we can see that there has been two orders as well as within the connector logs, we will also receive information messages telling us if an, the order has successfully been submitted. So we can see here that the, the sales order with the key sales order ID of two has been submitted with that sales order code. And we can see within the logs, all the details of that sales order that has been retrieved out. Now also within the logs, if we had the log type set to all or debug, we can see the underlying order data that is being sent across to squeeze.com. So that's the, the generated sales order that we've used that those data exports have been built up. And that's the data that's being sent across the squeeze. So that, that's relevant for if we need to debug why certain data is or is not appearing in those orders on squeeze.com. So that gives us uh, more details there that we've got accessible. And we, we can see that data for each order that is attempted to be submitted across. Now, once the sales order has been successfully submitted, if we log into squeeze.com, we will receive notifications of those orders that have been submitted if we're allowed to listen to those notifications for the organization. So here we can see that there has been two orders that were submitted by the connector software. And we can see the overall information about that, which accounts with those orders that were applied against, the sales orders that were raised against Squiz. And then we can go into the sales order and look at the de overall details of the sales order, such as the accounts, the billing and delivery address that we picked up from the connector and the pr products and pricing that were set for that as well as if there were any payments or surcharges applied to those orders. And we can also see in these notifications if those, those orders then when we're able to be order, automatically forwarded on to the corresponding connector or the connected business system at the other end. And it could be through another connector that those orders are importing, or it could be through the same connector that we exported the orders out from. It depends on how that organization has been set up to forward the orders on. Now, once those orders have successfully imported from the connector's point of view, if you click on the sales orders tab, there is a now a, a checkbox here called show exported orders. So if we click on that button, that will show us the orders that have been successfully submitted across to squiz.com. And this is how the connector keeps track to know which sales orders have been imported so that they make sure that those orders don't get imported again. Uh, we can click on the order number to view those details of those orders again that we had submitted out. But if we wanted to allow an order to be resubmitted, then we would have to remove it from this list by clicking the remove button and click on that option. If we run the data export again for the sales orders that were previously submitted across, if we then look at the logs of the history logs, we can see that now zero orders were submitted because the connector was able to detect that the previous orders that the orders that the export retrieved had already been submitted. So if we have the debugging logs turned on, we can see that the connector is able to detect that those orders that were previously exported have been found within the exported orders here. 
And because of that, it is not going to allow those orders to be submitted across again. So this is a protective mechanism to stop duplicate orders being sent across into squiz.com. In this example, if we had a directory of orders that was continually being built upon, then the connector will keep checking to make sure that only the new files that appear within this directory are the ones that can, should be able to get submitted across. So if we did want an, one of these orders to submit across again, we would just simply select that order, remove it from the list, and so when the export runs again, it will no longer find that order in the export list and allow it to submit across again. That could be a case if we wanted to submit the same order across multiple times, but in most cases, you don't want that to occur. So that shows you an, an example of how we can use the generic adapter to retrieve orders for a system that may be saying the sales order data to the file system. And then the, using the generic adapters data exports to retrieve those orders out submit them across to the squiz.com platform and then when squiz.com it can forward those orders across to the configured business system as well as if we had it turned on we can also submit those orders across to the freight carriers now when we import these orders there are a number of errors that could happen if squiz.com is able to validate those orders back within squiz.com's platform api documentation for the import organization sales order if we go down to the section called the uh, responses, we can see the number of different errors that could occur. And some of them are as simple as if the organization is not selling on the platform, then it's not allowed to receive orders. But if the customer account that is putting the order cannot be found, uh, that is a typical error that could be occur if it's not the order is missing information. It could be the case where the product it can't find the products or if the order needs to be repriced. Uh, if the pricing data is missing, then you'll get those kind of errors. If the surcharges can't be matched up, same with the payment types, um, cannot be found. Or if the organization is out of trading tokens, then th these are the kind of errors you would receive that would appear in the uh, connector. And it is best to look at the documentation on w what you need to do to try to fix up those, those orders. Within the Connectors 1.25 release, we've added the ability for it to integrate into Channel Advisor platform. And through Channel Advisor, we can integrate and export out orders from online based marketplaces, including eBay, Amazon, Kogan, Catch of the Day, Walmart, among hundreds of marketplaces that Channel Advisor support. So if you didn't know, Channel Advisor provides a way for organizations to sell across all the different marketplaces that they integrate into, allowing products to be synchronized and seamlessly managed through a Channel Advisor account, and then you can nominate the marketplaces you want to sell into. To show how this works, we have a diagram that's set up here. So Channel Advisor have integrations into the hundreds of different uh, online marketplaces. So your business may have an account with Channel Advisor, and then that elects to send your products across to eBay. And then from eBay, customers can then buy and raise sales orders and then those sales orders channel advisor will get retrieved and pushed into channel advisors uh, platform there we can use the connectors generic adapter it contains a new preset where we can then pull in the sales order and then the connector can export that sales order out of channel advisor system and then it can push it across into the e-commerce system such as quiz.com quiz.com makes sure to validate the order to so make sure it has all the required data to allow it to then go into the back-end business system and it might go via another connector in order to get that into the business system by using the channel advisor preset within the connectors generic adapter we can then get the sales orders automatically flowing through all end-to-end -end from the marketplaces to our business systems now optionally when the orders get into Squiz, we can also have those orders be go off into two places where they'll go across into the business system, but they also can get then forwarded onto our freight carriers. If we use the smart freight integration there, it allows the consignment notes to then get raised in the warehouse, or further automating and to cutting out more manual data entry warehousing staff would otherwise have to do. So this solution enables full end-to-end -end automation and allows us to cut out the manual data entry that would otherwise be required to get the sales orders through. So there are a few requirements in order for us to be able to set up the connector to be able to export data from Channel Advisor. Firstly, an organization needs to have signed up uh, to Channel Advisor and have account created for that organization. Secondly, a developer account needs to be created with Channel Advisor and an associated app that is linked to that developer account has also been created. Once an app has been registered against the developer account, then we need to link the app to the organization's Channel Advisor account. And by doing that, that gives permission to be able to get the API credentials to be able to then export out the orders from Channel Advisor. Now, in order for that to all happen, the organization must have set up their products in Channel Advisor and then assigned them out to the corresponding marketplaces to allow the, those products to be purchased by the customers on all the different marketplaces. To make this easier, I'm going to talk about how we can set up the developer accounts and do that linkages. 
uh, that we need to do. For setting up an, a, a Channel Advisor account, I would recommend do- talking to Channel Advisor and how to set up the product data using Channel Advisor's system. Now, separately for Squiz.com are also requirements so it can correctly validate the orders and in put in the missing information that Channel Advisor doesn't put into the orders to allow them to submit into our own business system. So first up, the organization needs to be registered on the Squiz.com platform. So a person has to be personally signed up to Squiz.com and then they have regi- registered their organization and they're an admin of that organization. Then they need to set up some API credentials so that allows the connector to push the orders through across to squiz.com and they also have to set up a connection to either a connector that is going to be used to import into the business system or to directly to the business system itself if it supports being fed orders into its system. As well as that, we need data from the business system being imported into squiz.com which includes tax code data, sell units, products, payment types, and customer accounts, and optionally locations if multi-location warehouses is also required for orders to import into a business system. If you wanted to automate freight, uh, you'd have to sign up to Smart Freight and set up the associated carriers in that separate system, which is outside the scope of this video. So now we'll go into the channel advisor on how we need to configure the connector to be able to retrieve orders out from channel advisor that have been landed in all these other online marketplaces. So once we have created our Channel Advisor organization account, we now then need to set up a developer account or we need to use a developer account of an existing business that is supporting your business if that is the case, such as Totex. We click on the request an account and that is a developer account and we fill out our detail to tell Channel Advisor which developer we are. Once that has been done, Channel Advisor then will send the details of our developer account so then we can log into Channel Advisor. So that's when we get to this screen where we need to enter the developer key that Channel Advisor have given us as well as the password that matches that key. So we put in under our developer key and password that we previously registered with and click the login button. So once we're logged into Channel Advisor, by, de- by default we'd have no applications that are registered against this developer account. So we click on create new application, you'd put in some basic details about the connector since that is connector is the application we're going to use to export data out of Channel Advisor. Now once that has been created then it would appear within this list. And then from there, we'll, we get the important things that we need to put into the connector, which is the application ID and the shared secret. So we need those pieces of credentials to allow our connector to be able to talk to Channel Advisor. Now, the other aspect that we need to do is we need to link this app to the organization that we want to retrieve the orders for. So to do that, we would click on the add integration and request tokens. Now from here, we would then need the person who is managing the organization's channel advisor account to log in. Uh, you will see a screen like this where you have to then choose a, the client of Channel Advisor that you want to link to the app. So once we select that app from the drop down and do the select client, then you have to allow the grant access for that application and then you can see the permissions that that application will have. So orders is very much important if you want to export the orders. Once the grant access button has been clicked on, then what will get returned is a screen that is showing us the access token and the refresh tokens and it is the refresh token that we need to copy out of this box it won't be a gray box it would actually have numbers and letters and that is very important this is the equivalent of a password so we use the refresh token in the connector to allow it to then generate access tokens when authenticating with channel advisor to allow us to access to get access to the orders that we want to export out from channel advisor so we copy that refresh token and we'll be using that in a minute to set up the connector if you go back into Channel Advisor, the developer account, if we've if done this correctly, you will see the organizations that has been linked to that app has now will now appear here. Note that you cannot get the access and refresh tokens again. They are once-off values that you can retrieve only when you're linking the apps up to the Channel Advisor account. So if you forget those or lose those credentials you're going to need to delete this app and go through this authentication step again so now that we've got that all set up then that allows us to go into the connector here and then configure the connector to be able to talk to channel advisor so i've set up a generic adapter here called channel advisor and then once we click on the settings button within the load adapter presets drop down there is now a preset called channel advisor sales order data exports so this is the new preset that we've added to the connector in the 1.25 release if we click on that and click on the load button click yes to allow it to load it in here's where we need to input those credentials that we'd previously set up in channel advisor so we need to put in the application id and shared secret which is obtained back on the developer login page so we'd copy this value here into here and then we'll put it in the colon character and then copy across this shared secret value 
and also put that into there. And then we need to get that refresh token that we previously copied from the new integration created dialog box. So we'd copy that value that was there, put that into here. There's a few other options that we need to set in the, in the preset. So one of the things is we need to determine which customer account in our own business system should be the account that our sales orders are raised against. In other systems, this could be called debtor instead of a customer account. It could also just be called a customer. But whatever that business system is, it has unique codes for each of its customers that the orders are, are raised against. So we'd either recommend setting up a customer account specifically for Channel Advisor and for all these online marketplaces, just a generalized customer account. Or you could also set up a customer accounts for each specific marketplace which you're raising the orders for. By default, the preset is set up that all orders across all the different marketplaces will be assigned to the one account, but you can also configure the adapter to be able to handle that second scenario. In our own business system, our accounting or enterprise resource planning system, we could have an account with a code called marketplace retail and so we'd set that value there. For orders coming out of Channel Advisor and via the online marketplaces, they, there may be freight charges that have been applied to those orders. So where that occurs in our associated business system that the orders are going into, we also need to specify the surcharge code for those freight surcharges. Some, in some systems, they may have a dedicated surcharge entities and then we need to put in the code of what they are. In other uh, business systems, they would be just the product or item codes. So we then need to set up a, an item for the our web freight surcharges. So we need to set the value here of what that item or that charge is called. So by default, we've called it web freight surcharge, but it might be just called a freight surcharge or might just be called freight depending on how you want to set that up in your system. Now here, this is a label that will appear on the sales orders. For now, we'll just leave it as freight fee. This is not uh, important to get right. Now, another surcharge that can be applied through the marketplaces is a, is a gift wrapping surcharge. So like the freight surcharges, we would need to set up the corresponding item or product or surcharge in our own business system that corresponds to uh, a gift wrapping, which is an additional charge that may be put on the orders. So we would set the relevant code for that. That may be just called a uh, gift wrapping. We can also give that a label. Now for orders coming out of Channel Advisor, there are a number of different ways in which Channel Advisor calculates tax. It either shows orders inclusive of a GST, that's a goods and service tax, or a, also known as a VAT or value added tax, or it could specify the amounts of tax applied to those product lines. But Channel Advisor doesn't tell us what kind of tax in any real detail is applied to those orders. So this is where we need to specify the tax code information that corresponds to the business system we're importing it into. So in our business system, we need to ensure that the tax code matches. So we might have a tax code called GST, or it could be something called tax code one, or it could be even one dash GST. So it's important to get, uh, for, to get this value the same as whatever our business system is set up the tax codes that we've imported into Squiz. So let's just assume that we've got a tax code called GST and we can set a label for that that will appear on the orders. And we need to specify and ensure that we've got the tax rates that are matching the order totals that are coming out from Channel Advisor. So if Channel Advisor is telling us that the prices coming out in, are including tax, we don't know what the tax rate is on those orders because Channel Advisor doesn't uh, advise us. So this is where we need to get this value right to ensure that we get the correct pricing calculations for tax when we're pulling the orders out from Channel Advisor. So if you're in New Zealand, it might be not a 10% rate. It may be 12.5 or it could be even higher if you're in another country. Uh, so we need to get that value and that needs to make sure that corresponds with the values you're setting up within Channel Advisor. For certain items, if they have no tax applied to them, that's when we get into the tax-free tax codes. So if Channel Advisor advises us that there is no tax applied against the the products being purchased from the marketplaces, from the different marketplaces, that's when we would be using this. It could have its own code, which is different uh, to tax-free. You need to set that up to make sure it matches up with the business system that the orders are being imported into. And we can set a label also for that tax code. Now, for the orders coming through the different marketplaces, they can also specify a payment has been applied to the orders. So, for example, if you're, an order is coming via eBay, then the, the customer purchasing that order may have already paid for it with PayPal. So this is when we get into the two different payment types that this preset is configured to look at. And that is a proprietary based payment method that is being used to pay for the order. So that could be PayPal, it could be Amazon's own payment service, it could be Apple Pay. That's when this proprietary payment method would be used. And if Channel Advisor advisor, it's just a, a standard credit card payment that has been applied, 
then we would use this payment type. So we need to get the unique identifiers of the payment types that are coming out of our business system and to specify them here. So that way Squiz can validate that the correct payment types have been assigned against the orders. So we've used these little these acronyms CC and PP. This these could be values such as a a, a GUID, which is a, a unique identifier, which could, be, could have uh, quite long letters and numbers, as opposed to a human known identifier. So it's important to get these these codes that match up with our business system as well. So for now, we'll just leave them as simple as that. Now, when the connector is looking at orders that are sitting in Channel Advisor, we can elect for it to only look at orders where payments have been denoted as being cleared. That means that if an order is being paid by PayPal, Pay Channel Advisor confirmed that PayPal have cleared that order. So there could be the case where a customer is paid for the order, but then Channel Advisor hasn't been able to be notified that the payment cleared. So we've got an option in the connector. If we want to look at all orders that Channel Advisor have ripped out of these different marketplaces regardless of if the payments have cleared or not or we can elect for the connector to only look at orders that have specifically had cleared payments which would be the safer option so by default that's set to wire but if you want to allow all sales orders found by channel advisor through the marketplace then you would set that value to n otherwise now the adapter when it's trying to retrieve out the sales orders we need to specify how many days back should it look through the orders that have been that have landed in channel advisor so rather than trying to for the connector to retrieve out all the sales orders that may be landing in channel advisor system we can elect for it to only look back at a certain number of days so this avoids hundreds or thousands of requests needing to be made every day back to channel advisor we only need to get say the last number of days so by default that's it to the last two days worth of orders as long as the generic adapter's data, sales orders data export uh, is able to run within two days, it'll ensure that those orders are being picked up. If you want the connector, say, running to be only picking up orders once a week, then you need to make sure this value is set to a longer period of time. Maybe seven or eight days would be more appropriate. But if you're having it look for orders every, say, couple of hours, then two days would be more than enough to ensure that if any errors occur when trying to retrieve orders, the next time it happens, uh, the next hour, that those orders will then be picked up. Two is uh, generally a safe number if you're going to be running this export on a daily or hourly basis. So once we've configured all of our settings, click the Save Settings button. Our preset has been now loaded. We will see a Channel Advisor API data source type. And by default, that the data set already has Channel Advisor's API, which we used in order to retrieve out the orders and it's going to retrieve data back from Channel Advisor in the JSON data format. Now, if we go into the data exports tab and we look through each of these different data exports, we can see that the sales orders export has already been pre-configured and it's already been set up to the data that is coming out of Channel Advisor's API. So we can see that they've they got a thing called a site order ID, which corresponds to the sales order code and I have an ID field, which corresponds to the key sales order ID. So we've already done the default mappings for the all the different sales order data exports where we can pull out sales order data from channel advisor system so there's not much really you need to do here in order to have this work as it should uh, it's only really the case where you want to tweak in different places where that needs to happen but by default you shouldn't have to touch this too much at all but if you do need to such as see how it is correctly doing all the calculations for pricing you have the ability to look through here through these different data field mappings in order to see how that is configured. The other export that's been set up for the preset is the data source session creator. This is the data export that communicates to Channel Advisor and authenticates initially with Channel Advisor using those tokens that we had generated as well as our application key and shared passwords. So they will appear both within the request headers for the data source session create as well as request body. So if we, if we change the application that we were using, we would then need to update the values here. And that is uh, a base64 value of the both the application ID and this shared secret, as well as the refresh token that was granted to the application for the channel advisor organization it's, it's retrieving sales orders for. So that's only really relevant to update if some the credentials change within channel advisor. Uh, with our adapter now set up, we then cl click on the adapter button and here is where we need to set up the credentials for our organization in squiz.com. 
And this is when we would specify the organization ID, our API key and passwords for the organization in squiz.com. Now, we want to make sure that this reprice exported sales orders setting is set to no. Otherwise, when Squiz imports the orders, it will, it will try to reprice the orders. And we wouldn't want uh, orders being repriced when they've already been paid for through and confirmed through the online marketplaces since the end consumers won't be very happy if the pricing changes. For both the channel advisor and squiz.com credentials, then we can go into our exports and routines button. Select the export sales orders option. Choose the squiz.com platform that we want to export the orders that are going to be retrieved out of channel advisor. Click the run once off button. Now, if all has run successful in the history log, we will see the number of orders that successfully have been imported into squiz.com. As well as within the logs, we'll be able to also to see the details of the sales orders that have successfully been submitted across. As well as that, within squiz.com itself, we would receive a sales order a notification if we're listening to the sales orders for that organization we're connected to. And then we'll also be able to send the notifications where those orders, the, org, the customer accounts that they had been raised against, the order totals, as well as the order numbers that Squiz has rated for those orders. We can also go into and view the details of the orders where we can then see the further details of the delivery and billing information about that, as well as the, the amounts, the surcharges, the taxes, and the payments that have been applied to those orders. Now, once in the connector, they, the orders are in the exported list, then the connector will use these orders, these exported orders, to ensure that if, when the next time the sales order export is run, that the same orders aren't being duplicated and imported and sent across to squiz.com. Um, and it will compare the list of orders that are here to reduce the chances of that happening because the last thing we want is duplicate orders being imported into back into our own business system. But if any time we had to re-import an order, we would just simply select the order here, remove it from the list, and then run the sales orders export again to allow that order to be picked up and then to be submitted across to squiz.com and then forwarded onto associated business systems as well as the freight carrier systems via smart freight if we had that selected. For the export sales orders, typically you're going to want to set this up to run on a scheduled basis. So we would typically set up a schedule for that to run, say, once an hour if you wanted to pick up orders once an hour. But if you're not getting that many orders through the marketplaces, maybe once a day maybe suffice. It depends on how your business is configured to process and dispatch the orders that have been made through those online marketplaces. Choose what time of the hour that you want that to next uh, run. So we might want to have that run at 12:15 uh, at a.m. And we also may want to send out notifications when things go wrong with the export and have that scheduled in. So that so once that has been scheduled and click the reload button and that will run once an hour every hour and then keep holding channel advisor for the new sales orders that it makes available from all the associated marketplaces that your organization's channel advisor account is configured to uh, sell in. There are some settings that we may want to change in the channel advisor integration. Back within the generic adapter, one of the things you may want to do is have the orders be applied to different accounts. So within the sale order data export, this is the export that gets all the details from this of the sales order from Channel Advisor. And the, the things we really care about here is the customer account code. So you can see here from the preset when we initially configured it, it's putting, it's hard coding the value marketplace underscore retail. We may want to choose different marketplaces that we want the orders to be raised against different accounts for. So when we get the details of a sales order out of Channel Advisor, one of the things that the Channel Advisor order has this piece of data called the site ID. And it, in, within the developer documentation here, it lists all the different marketplaces Channel Advisor integrate into. So for example, if we wanted to have an account set up for orders raised from uh, the catch marketplace, then we could use the site ID of 1133 and then we can put in a, an if condition here that says that if site ID is equal to the string 1133 then we want to assign that order to the account with the code marketplace underscore catch otherwise we want to assign it to marketplace underscore retail so we could keep setting up more if conditions for the different marketplaces that we're both selling into. So we just need to nest multiple if conditions we might be selling within the Amazon AU so we would select that out. And then in our corresponding business system, we would also then need to set up uh, a customer account that we want to target and have the order separately raised against. Now, the reason why you might do this is because you want to use different reporting tools in that business system. 
to be able to then work out how many orders are, go- are coming from the different marketplaces and then you can do some reports on that, some trends or how you want to manage stock and do some forwarding forecasts as well as report the results back uh, within your business. So, that is the, the primary way in which you can assign orders to different customer accounts in those systems. And you do have the options here to remap any of these fields if you feel like the preset isn't doing the right way for your system. Or if Channel Advisor in the future change their fields, uh, then you may have to change these mappings. But I suggest only changing these if you have uh, key knowledge in the how the API works for Squiz.com and how the, da- the sales order data is coming out of Channel Advisor. Now, there are some failures that could occur when we try to run the sales orders export for exporting the data out of Channel Advisor. The first one is if you have not set up the squiz.com credentials correctly, then you'll get an error such as this where uh, the organization doesn't exist. Another typical error would be if you saw this error occurred occurred when trying to make a HTTP request. If this error returns a 400 error, then that has a responsibility of invalid client that's telling you then the credentials you log into Channel Advisor system are incorrect. So this means you need to then setting up the preset, put in the correct credentials, all those credentials have could have been changed in Channel Advisor and they need to be replaced within the data source session create in both the refresh token needs to be set again or the the application ID and shared secret needs to be updated or you need to set up the permissions again within Channel Advisor to allow the developer account to then its app to allow to get access to that specific organization. So there are a number of errors around authentication which could cause one of these errors when trying to make a HTTP request. Other errors could be if there is a failed connection, such as if the internet has gone down for the connector that is trying to access the orders from Channel Advisor's system. And then also when the orders are being exported out from Squiz, there are a number of errors that Squiz could return if the order data is invalid. Uh, Within Squiz.com's documentation center, under the platform API, For the import organization sales order endpoint, you can view a list of the typical errors that will occur if squiz.com is unable to validate and submit those orders across. And within the documentation, you can see a list of all the different errors that could be. Mainly, it's either to do with uh, the organization isn't selling on squiz.com or the data for the organization doesn't match up with what's in the order, such as the customer account cannot be found Uh, The product data, the products cannot be found, Uh, it's missing pricing, the surcharges can't be found, the payment type can't be found, or the the organization doesn't have enough trading tokens to be allowed that sales order to import. Those are the main errors that could occur. Within the Squiz.com Connectors 1.25 release, we've added a new capability to the generic adapter to have a data routine that is able to run the operating system commands that exist within a batch script file. So if you weren't already aware, a batch script file allows operating system commands to be run, such as if we were running in a terminal here that allows different things to occur on that operating system, such as allowing files to be removed or created or deleted, or allowing different applications to be run or allow them to perform certain actions. So if we take an example back from the first topic in this video, in that topic, we had the concept of where a application was generating out some sales order files and storing them into a directory on the file system. Now, we may want to move these files out of this directory and put them into another directory once the connector has processed those sales orders and exported them out to an associated system. So this is a good candidate for where we could use a batch script file to do this. So in this folder, we've got a separate folder here called sales orders processed. So after we've exported the files out, at a later stage, we want to run a routine that will move these files across into this directory. In a directory, I've created a batch script file called move sales order files. And if we open that file in a text editor, it has a single operating system command called the move command. And it specifies the directory where we want to move all the files within that directory across into the other directory. So it's a, this is a very simple example of how a batch script file can be written and we can come up with some very crazy complex things that a batch script files can do. It just depends on what your needs are. So once that file has been created and it exists on the file system, back within the generic adapters window, under the data routines tab, within the routine types drop down, there is a new routine called run batch script file. If we select that and then click the create routine button, they'll create that new routine and we'll give it a name such as move sales order files. 
and save that routine. Within that routine, we have one setting that is available here where we need to set where is the path to the batch script file that we want the connector software to run. So we'll copy the directory structure for that and put that into this field. And we'll get the name of the file that we need to execute. So it needs to have the .bat extension to denote that that is a Windows batch script file. Now, once that's done, this routine has now been configured. So we then can go into the export routines button for that adapter that the routine was created for. And we can see that routine now appears within the list. When we click the run once off button, that will then cause this routine to run. That will cause a process to be created in the operating system to then run that batch script file. Now, if it's all successful when we run that, we should see these two files disappear from this directory and then they'll appear in this sales orders process directory. So we click the run once off button. Now, if there's no errors within the connector's logs, then that tells us that that batch script file process was started successfully, but it does not guarantee that the the, the commands in the script file were executed successfully. So for this case, we'll look at the directory so we can see that those files have been removed and we can see that they're now in the new directory. So this batch script file was successfully able to run. Now, when you're running commands in a batch script file, you may need to know what are the outcomes of those commands that run from that file. Since it may be the case where the connector cannot know the commands are happening in this file, it can only cause this file its commands to start getting executed. So that's where you might want to put more detail in this file, such as getting the output from your command and storing them in a separate log file. And this is particularly in when it's important to understand what the batch script file is doing. So I've got this angled bracket character and now that's when the move command gets called, it's now gonna put the outputs of that move command across into this separate file here, I've got log file. So if we run that again, we can now see in the sales orders processed folder, there is a now a file here called log file. And we can see the outputs of that command to do the move. And for that move command, it's telling us which files it was successfully able to move across into the directory that has been set here. If you have the debugging or all logs turned on for the connector, you can also see that there is some information that will run every time the batch script file is attempted to be executed. So it'll tell you the path to the file and it'll also tell you any errors if there are errors occurs when it tried to start the batch script file being executed. Now, the other important point is that when these batch script files are processes are being started, they're being run with the user that the connector host service has been set to run as. So when the connector host service, that's the, the service for the connector that runs always in the background of Windows, if we look at that service and go into its properties, Within the logon tab, this tells us which Windows user the connector host running as. So when the batch script files are executed, they're executed with the user that is set here. So the local system account is the overall Windows system account. But otherwise, if you may need to have that batch script file execute with specific Windows user, because that other Windows user may have permissions to access certain directories, files, or network shares. So when that occurs, you may need to require to run the connect the host service with a specified Windows account. So you'd have to put in the name of the, the user. But also note that if you change this setting, then other aspects of the connector host service will also be running as this user, such as if you're uh, executing ODBC commands, then it's going to be in the context of this Windows user here. And that may cause other permission issues in other adapters. So be careful around when you're running batch script files, working out which user is executing and what which context is the batch script file running as. Also within the run batch file script routine, there is a, the, also the ability to set additional arguments that we want to pass to a batch script file. So not just calling the file, we might want to tell, give additional pieces of information that allows uh, the commands that are being executed to do something with other data. So we can add data fields to the routine to allow us to set what the values of those, those arguments are. So within the source field, we just need to put the value of what that argument is. So here I've got the first argument. So we need to activate that field if we want to pass it across to the batch script file. And we might have two arguments are getting passed to it like I have set up here. So within the batch script file now, I've added another command here that is going to get the values of each of those arguments that were set in the routines data fields. And it's gonna simply output the, the values of those arguments to also this same log, log file that we had uh, displayed. So now when I run the batch script file routine within the connector, within the log file itself, we can now see the arguments uh, data fields that we put into the routine have been passed across and outputted through that echo command. 
Now, it's important within the routine that you properly escape the, if you're using double quote characters within your arguments, then you properly escape them out, just like how you would in the command line to make sure that those characters properly get passed across. Otherwise, errors may occur when you try to run the routine. And the common errors you're going to get when running a routine is whether or not the correct file has been set against the routine. So if the file is incorrect, then you're going to get uh, a couple of errors that display like this, such as it's unable to run the routine and it'll tell you the cause of the error message. And we can also see within the logs, what are the values of the arguments being passed across to the batch script file if we have the debugging turned on. So those are the typical errors you're going to have. There could be other areas such as the bat script file uh, does have not have permission to run. That could be because the Windows permission set up for the system user or the user that the connector host service is running as is not allowed to execute that batch script file. That is the typical other error messages you're going to get uh, when using this functionality. So once we've got our routine set up and configured correctly, within the export routine window, you typically want to schedule this to run and on a periodic basis. So for example, we might have this run once a day after say the sales order data export has run for the adapter. So we'd set up for that to run say here at 10.43 uh, p.m. And then we might have a routine to move the sales order files that that export is using. And then we might have that run at an hour later. And so that way we can ensure that the orders are uh, absolutely not being processed again. And those order files are getting put into the correct directories on the file system. So that shows you a full end-to-end -end example of how you can use this run batch script file process to execute batch script files that exist on the file system to cause different commands on our operating systems to automatically happen at certain times that we set up within the scheduler in the connector software or to run them on a once off basis. And all of this can ultimately lead to us being able to automate a number of tasks and not having to manually uh, run, execute these commands or move files around or do whatever that batch script file, ultimately saving time and money and reducing lots of uh, potential errors as well. Within the squiz.com 1.25 release, we've added a number of enhancements to the data sets feature within the connector software. So if we open up a connector, I've got one here for a company called Donut Factory. Within the data sets window, upon clicking on the locations, there's a, the ability to set location attribute values for each of the locations we have imported in, into a data set. So the data set allows a list of locations that could be physical geographic locations, such as stores or warehouses to be set up as well as non-physical locations that represent an overall area or an aspect of an organization. So in our example here, we've got some warehouses that our organization has or is maintaining, as well as we've got a number of stores. Now the standards allow us to put a whole bunch of different information about those locations, such as address information, the location type, contact phone number and email and website. But there are limits to how much fields are available in both the e-commerce standards as well as the data set table here. So we may wish to apply additional information about these locations and that's where the location attributes tab comes in. So attributes allows us to find the types of fields, basically custom fields, where we can enter additional information about those locations. So firstly, within the attributes, you want to set up an attribute file for the attributes of location. So a logical thing would be to set up a profile called location. And for our location attribute profile, we want to set up some fields or some attributes that we can put, start putting some data against for our location. So for our attribute location, if we enter the key attribute profile ID, this is where we get the, to define the fields. So naturally, physical geographic location can have a number of different things that we can how we can describe it one of them might to do with parking the number of parking spaces so we might call an attribute called number of parking spaces also within that attribute we may also want to list the number of disabled spaces as well now within that location we may want to know how we can load goods and services so we might have an attribute that describes the number of loading bays and then for all these since they're being stored we want to store only numbers against these values so we set the data type to number now, once we've set the attribute profile and attribute data, if we go back to the locations, click on the find reload button to update this table, we can now see we've got our location attributes here. And then for each of these locations, we can start entering some information. For this Melbourne CBD store, we might have it so that it has 100 parking spaces and maybe five disabled spaces at the front of it. And then that store may also have three loading bays. 
And then for our next door here, that could have 50 parking spaces, two disabled spaces at the front of the building, and then only one loading bay. So as you can see here, I'm just adding additional information about these locations. And then once we have this additional information, we can export that out with the location data, allowing it to be displayed in any of the places that the associated e-commerce platforms allow us to view them in. Ultimately, this leads to more information being able to be set against these locations based on the kind of data we want to store against locations. The other attributes are also displaying this table, so you may wish to also filter some of this data out. Within the filter column, we may only wish to care about those those like location columns. So anything with the key attribute of D of three is a location base attribute. We can reduce the amount of uh, columns that we need to manage when we're setting up this data. And we can also filter the records that display in this table as well. So we may only care about locations that have the word store in it if we, we're only putting information about uh, store locations. So this makes it easier. So now we can then particularly target what data we need to put against these three different stores. Now, as with the same with attributes against products, we can also set multiple values against each attribute. So you simply select the value and in click, click on the insert key on your keyboard and that will duplicate this row. So it may be selling brand A. And then if we click, click on the insert button, we can also say it is selling brand B products as well as brand C products. So that's how we can set up multiple values against each attribute that is stored in this table. Now the other things we can do is we, we can paginate. So if we've got lots of locations, we click on the next and previous button to paginate across. We can limit the amount of location data that displays. We can also delete these values by simply clearing the fields out of the, the table values that will delete those attribute values. If we've got a lot of attribute columns, we can also paginate between the different columns using these next and previous buttons. And we can also lock the columns, such as if we got many attributes that are displaying, then when we scroll across, you will see that the location data does not move, whereas all the attribute columns do. So that's what the lock uh, checkbox does. And we can filter to show all active location attribute data, or we could also target data that is not being updated or changed as well using that filter. So here's an example where we might have a dealer locator, which is designed to show locations. And then we can use that attribute data to, such as to filter the locations that appear on the map based on the product brands that have been set against our locations. And this data can be used for a range of different things, such as being able to provide filtering, as well as be able to show additional information about the locations. Now, once we've got the data set up in the data set, we need to be able to export that data out. And in order to do that, back within the connector for a generic adapter, within the data exports, there is a new export called location attributes. And here, if we're getting it from a data set file, we'd need a data set source that has been set up to read from the data sets SQLite database. Within the location attributes data export, we need to enter the data sets table, which is called location attribute value. And we'd also want to put in the custom condition to only get active uh, attribute values that are set for locations. Within the data fields, we need to set all the fields here that are listed here, and they are named all the same within the data sets database. We also want to turn on and activate the number and the string values. And if we click the test query, export query, we can test to make sure that we are getting that attribute data out of there. So with that all configured, we can now export the location attributes. And what the export will do is for every value that finds a key location ID for, it will then assign the attributes to the location set up in the locations data export. The collection of attribute values for each location is assigned to a location record which is then can be exported to the e-commerce systems using the locations data export. Now, if we want to import locations attributes within into a data set, we then just need to select the, the locations data export for the where the data is coming from. And if that has the attribute data included, then we just select the connected data set and it will then run. If it's run as full, then it'll, it'll deactivate any records that were previously imported or set up against locations that are no longer imported. Otherwise, if it's set to incremental, it will just flag those attributes as being not updated. So that gives you an idea of the capabilities now within data sets to set up location attribute data, allowing us to set up dedicated fields and the details of that data against each attribute record that we are managing within the data set. And those locations could be in imported into a data set from any external systems uh, where the connector can read that location data from, uh, such as accounting and enterprise resource planning systems, as well as warehouse management systems, as well as any systems, spreadsheets or databases that store location information. Within the connector's 1.25 release, 
We've added a new capability to the data sets feature to be able to view and manage a set of category trees that define a collection of categories that belong to each category tree. Within the data sets tab, clicking on to view a data set, under the categories section, click on the categories button, there is now the category trees tab, and that allows us to, to create category trees. And a business may set up multiple category trees to represent either catalogs or to re represent different navigation ways of users being able to find their products. So a typical uh, use case is within e-commerce websites is that there's multiple ways for users to be able to navigate through and find products. The usual way is you have a product catalog that may have uh, categories that are associated with the, the types of products that a business is selling. But you may also have a separate category tree that allows users to search for products based on brands and navigating through the brands category tree, such, such as we have here where the user gets to choose a brand and from there they can find the products associated with that. So within the data set, we can now represent the overall category trees. We have a category tree called product catalog, which allows us to view the entire range of products we may sell. But we may also create another category tree called brands and we'll give that a unique identifier. So the key category tree, tree ID needs to be the unique identifier of a category tree. So no two records can be the same. And same for the category tree code, we want to give it a human identifiable code that represents that tree. And then we can also set a name and a description for that tree. So naturally we can set a description for what that tree represents. So in this case, we're talking about uh, product brands. And then we've also got the ordering field. So if these trees were uh, displayed in a list, we can determine which one would come first, such as uh, we could set the value one and set the value two, or we, we might want this one to come first. So we might set that to one and this other next one set to two. So those are the fields that are available for that. And we can also denote if our category tree are active and whether or not they're updated as well. See when these records were created and last modified and put any additional notes against these trees when then we're setting them up. So once we've got our category tree ID set, then we can go into our categories. And we can start assigning our different categories to the trees that they belong to. So we've already done this for these products that we have here. So we have donuts, uh, buns and bagels. Uh, so they're all assigned to the same category tree, but we might set up a separate category tree which contains the brands. So we get the key category tree ID and then we start assigning that to the relevant categories there. Th that's all there is to it. We can continue to use the categories records that appear here. And then when we export this data out of the data set, then we can have these, these categories appear under the different category trees. Now to, to export that data out, if we go to the, back to the adapters and messages, for a given generic adapter, if you click on settings, then click on data exports, you'll see that there is now a category trees data export. And if we're exporting this from a data set, then we just choo a, choose an SQLite database that is linked to the data sets underlying SQLite database file. The table where the category tree data is stored is called category tree. And typically we only want to export out the active category trees. So we click the save settings. And then we can set up these data fields. So for a data set, they have the names of the category tree fields are exactly the same as the e-commerce standards fields. So we just activate them, test that out. And we can verify we're pulling out the same data from the category tree. So that export has now been set up and click the reload data fields to allow to take that in, in, into effect. So what happens here is when the categories export is called for the generic adapter, it will attempt to export the list of category trees, put them into the standards document, then separately export the category data and then assign the products to those category records that have been retrieved out. Within the export routines button, if we run the categories data export, that will now attempt to retrieve also the category trees that we had previously stored in our data set. But in the generic data, that category tree data could be coming from a web service or file in the JSON, CSV or XML data source types, as well as within compatible ODBC and Microsoft SQL server databases as well. That support has been enabled in the export categories data export for the generic adapters. Now for the other adapters that also allow exporting out category data, so such as the MyObXO, Micronet and AccountWrite adapters, if you click on the settings button there, for the data exports tab, we only have the category exports. We don't have separate exports to, to get the list of categories, but since that system only supports us getting single records that have the relationships between products and categories. But what we've added here is the category tree fields through this export. 
And this allows us to set up fields within this system, the MyOB account right system, and then set custom fields and set the values for how those custom fields, uh, where the category tree data may be stored within that system. And how this works is that for the first record that contains a category tree value, then that will then be used and the fields here to get the name and details of that category tree. And then that would be then exported out. And if the second row had the same details, then that would be ignored. So it's only going to look at each unique category tree value to determine the category tree records that it needs to export out. And that is the same for all the other adapters that have a category products data export. In this circumstance, this database only support one category tree. And then in here, we may want to hard code the values for that category tree. So this might be called product catalog and you may give it a description and a code as well in those other fields to allow that data to export correctly. And now if these fields are not left turned on, if they have left blank, then that's okay. It just means the category tree records would not be exported out with the category data and the system that they're being, the data is being exported or imported into may either create default category trees to handle them or they may ignore those categories associated to that have no category tree to be simply ignored. So it's, it's worth checking the, the squiz.com and Todex e-commerce platforms uh, to work out how they handle importing category tree data. So using this, we can now set up many category trees. So we might set up category tree for each year that we have a product catalog. So that could be our 2020 year. We may set up a category tree for the previous years. You could even set up category trees that are for uh, such as a, a core aspect of the products that we have. So you might have automotive parts, then you might have a just a motorbikes category tree. So that's everything to do with motor, motorbike parts and accessories. And then you might set up a, an overall tree for another aspect such as merchandise. Now it really depends on how many trees you wanna create because naturally the more trees you create, the more selections that need to happen by the users to work out where the product data is stored. So uh, you may not want to have too many category trees as well as depending on how the how they're displayed uh, could make it more confusing for the user. You may wish to only have one category tree and that's also easier to manage or you may have a, want to have a combination of uh, two, or, two or more. It's really just really depends on how far and how much management you want to do, the types of ways you want users to be able to search and find products within the combination section of the data set for the combination profile field values to customize the ordering of the field values that display. So to give you context of what that all means, if we are looking on a website that has imported product combination data, this allows the user to be able to choose when they view a product to be able to choose options on what child product that is linked to these options they wish to purchase. So it basically allows them to filter out and refine the kind of product they're wishing to purchase. So the product combinations defines both the, the fields that the user can choose from as well as the values for each field and then which value combinations such of the, of the multiple fields that are set up that are linked back to a physical product. So within the data sets feature here, this is where we can set up profile. So we've set up here an example chair profile. And then within that chair profile, we define the fields that the user is able to select from. So we've set up two fields, one called color and one called style. And then within the combination profile field values, we can set all the options for each of those fields. So for the color field, we have three options that have been created here, burgundy, super red and red. And for the style field, we have the values armrest, fix back and swivel. So the new capability we have in the connector is this column here called ordering, where we get to set the position of these values when they appear in a list, such as when they're appearing in a drop down here. Within the ordering field, we can set a numeric value on how we want these values ordered. So we may want burgundy to come up first and then red to come up second and then the super red to come up third. And then the same here for the style, we may want to customize which option comes up at which position within the list. So that's what we have this ordering field is now available to do. And that is very important when in other systems, they may sort these values alphabetically. That may be not what we want. So with those values set up, if we've already assigned the, that profile, that chair profile to a product called uh, that represents the parent or the abstract product, 
and then we've assigned these options to the child products. So for example, we have a, d a bunch of different products here that are, have the different combination values that determined when those products are selected. With that, all those values set, then when the data is exported from the combinations data export, if we go back into the generic adapter in the settings button, under the combination profile field values, in the data fields tab, there is no ordering field because the standards do not support the ordering of attribute values. But what we can use instead is set an order by clause within the SQL like query that is going to be used. And we can use that new field value called ordering. Once we save that, and then we can test this query out. Running that, we can see that this will now order the field values here based on the ordering field that is available. And so when these fields get exported out and into the e-commerce platforms, based on the order in the records in the standards, they can then determine the order of these values uh, and they can set them against their system so that ultimately the correct ordering will also display in any drop downs or selections where those combination field values show. Also note that if you are importing combination data into a data set, that the under the combination profile field values tab, the ordering value will not be set when the data is imported. They, these ordering values have to be manually set within the data set. So this is a small change to data sets that provides a little more customization, which is particularly important when you're selling many products that are very similar and you wish to reduce the amount of products customers initially see, but then allow further filters on that determines the final product that they purchase. And this can make it much quicker for the customer to find and ultimately purchase the product that they're looking for, leading to a good shopping experience. Within the Connectors 1.25 release, we've added a new capability to the datasets feature to be able to generate a report that tells us what product fields are missing data. And this can be very helpful for data maintainers that are needing to set up and manage data across a large product list. To take an example, in our data set here, we've imported 8,038 products. As you can see, there is a quite a lot of product data that is available here. Now, if one of these fields was missing data, such as here, we've only got barcodes set in these four fields, then it may take a lot of time for us to sort through the 8,000 records and determine how many fields are missing data. So that's where there is this new capability. If we click on the arrow under the products button and select the create missing product data report, that will open up its associated window and now we've got the ability to select which product fields do we, we want to find out that have missing information. So we might want to target the, this first description field as well as the barcode fields. So once we've selected the fields, we want to find out which products are, that are missing data for. We've got these other filters that we can determine if we only want to look at products that are active in the data set, not active, updated, and not active. And we've also got options on how we want to generate the underlying data that gets place into the spreadsheet CSV file that determines how the data is structured. Typically, you don't want to really touch these settings unless you've got a particular format that you want the CSV data to display as, but for, for the most part, you'll just leave them the way they are. Then click the generate report CSV file button. And now we get to have a choice where we want to save the report. I'm going to just overwrite this file that I already previously saved. Click the save button. And that will then generate the spreadsheet file and open it in our selected spreadsheet editor. So for me, I've got LibreOffice installed on this machine, but it could easily be Microsoft Excel if you've got Microsoft Office installed. So within the spreadsheet file, it'll generate a list of all the products that are missing the selected fields that we had set up. So we can see here we had two fields selected, the description one and the barcode field. So anywhere where there is a Y value, that's telling us for that product, it is missing a value in that barcode field. So if we scroll down here, we can see that there's many products that are missing the barcode. And then we can also see that there are some products that are also missing the description as well as the barcode fields. So if we're wanting to set up description data, we, we can then target these products that we then want to go back through and then add the product data to. So in the data set, we can quickly find that product code and we can see that it's got an empty description and now we, we can then set our description for that product. So naturally you can choose to target only a single field or you can target all the fields. It really depends on what data you're wanting to find out where there is missing information. 
Besides these fields that are listed here, which are all the columns that are available against the products in a data set, we can also add our own customized fields. So we may want to find all products that are not assigned to a category. So we would tick the include button on the new missing field and then put in the condition. Now this needs to be an SQL query that relates back to the product database that sits in the data sets underlying data table. So we would write a query using an inner subselect to be able to determine if a product is not assigned to a category. So I've given this custom field a label called missing category and I put in this custom SQL query that allows us to check to see each product is assigned to a given category. So there's a table in the data set database called category product and basically we're trying to determine whether or not it is joined to the category product table. If it is, subselect query will turn a value Y. And when that says value Y, then the product is assigned to the category. So then we can return the value no saying it is not missing data or else it is not assigned and it is missing data. So these custom conditions have to evaluate out to either a value of Y or N. You can write very custom and very detailed logic to determine how these conditions are set up. So we could easily uh, tech check to see if product is not just missing in a category, if it's not assigned to a flag, a location, maybe there's no alternate code set up, we can go uh, and create very customized queries to capture all that information. So once we click the generate report CSV file, we'll save the file to the disk again. And then when that generates out, we can now see that we have 26 products in our data set that are not assigned to any active category. Now we can go back and find these products by going to the category products, do a search on that given product, and then we can choose to assign it to a certain category and that product will now appear under that category when it's displayed in any external e-commerce platforms where this data, this data set data is being exported to. So that highlights the power of this reporting capability. Now another new addition we added is to the generic adapter to be able to set it up so that a data set routine can be also generated that contains this same report. And once we select that the generate data set missing da product data report, we can give it a name. Then we've got a whole bunch of fields so we can then uh, specify the data set, the path to the data set that contains that missing data. So we just copy that from the data set settings and paste it into that, that field there. Then we've got all the same settings that we had in the report window. If we want to get active, inactive, updated, not updated, the CSV field uh, formatting and whether or not we want to also have an option to send out the report as an email. So if that's set to true, then we need to specify the email addresses. And in the two email address, we can have this report go out to multiple emails by using the comma delimited list. And we can also change the subjects of this routine. And this, what this routine will do is it will also generate this file, save it to the location which is specified in this CSV file save path setting, uh, such as we've set up here. And it will save it to that file there called missing data report. And also note that if you're going to turn the emailing on, you need to put, besides setting the value true, you also need to set up the SMTP outgoing email settings for this adapter for the emails to send out specifically. Then within the data fields tab, we can once again choose which fields we want to export out. So we could export out the product, desc the description one field. So we just need to set that active. We can change the label of what that field will be set when the report is generated. And we can also, we've also got some examples here of how to set up some of those those custom conditions so we just simply enable them such as we want to find products that are not signed to a category or not signed to an image so we turn them on and you can also customize these queries further if you want to by modifying the source field once all this data has been set up if we click on the export routines for that adapter and click on the routines tab we can now see that we have the missing product data report routine that we just created and then if we click on the run once off button, that routine will then generate the file, just like how it did before within the data sets window. Then we can open and view that spreadsheet just how we did previously. And we can see all the products that are missing the, the data that we had turned on for that. So by having this run as a routine, we can then schedule this report to be generated at particular times of the day. Say we might want to have every week, it sends out a re report telling us what data we are missing against our products. And because of that, we can then have a data maintainer reads that report and goes off and puts in the missing information. And that's particularly important if we're, if, if we're importing data, say products from other systems, such as we might have an accounting or ERP system or a another spreadsheet file that we're getting that product data from, then 
when it imports, we can have that import into a data set, run one of these missing data reports, then we can fill in the gaps where the, where the data isn't being passed across and then ensure that those products appear correctly on the websites for the e-commerce platforms that it's been exported to. Now, besides that, if we close that window, when this routine runs, within the information messages here, it will also give you a count of the number of products that are missing data for each of the different fields. So, we can see that here in this data set, there are 25 products that are missing data in the description one field. There are 8,338 products that are not assigned to any image and there are 24 products not assigned to any category. Within these info logs, we can get an overview of what that information is, as well as this data also appears within the email report that gets sent out. So the email report will tell us these same numbers, as well as attach this missing data report to the email itself, and it will also advise if the report had run successfully or not. And as I was saying before, for the email and capability to send out against the adapter, the email settings need to be configured here, particularly the email server, because this determines how the connector sends the email out through which outgoing email server. That's what this setting here is. And if there's credentials, such as if you're sending it through Office 365, you will have to put in your username and password credentials of an account in Office 365, as well as Office 365 outgoing email server to allow the connector to send emails out through that service and then be forwarded onto the relevant email addresses that are sent for the report. So this is a very handy tool, especially for data maintainers, and to quickly find and work out which products where we need to set the missing data and to ensure that those products correctly display on our websites or wherever they're being exported out of the connector to. And that is a wrap of the 1.25 connector release. For more information, you can go to the doc center of the connector, go to version history, and then you can view all the details of the release. Also, feel free to subscribe and like the squiz.com channel to receive future notifications when we release great new connector releases. And you can also go to the squiz.com platform and go to the connector feed by clicking on the profile button. And then under the feeds tab, there is the squiz.com connector feed where you can ask any questions about what is happening with the connector. Until next time, have fun with the connector and have a great day.